My name is Jim Stallings, and I'm the program director of the chess program here at UT Dallas. And we're very pleased tonight to have another in our long-going series of the Chess Educator of the Year, Mr. Jim Ede. And you'll hear more about him in just a minute. But we will be having a presentation for about approximately 40 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A period. At the end, we'll do the award presentation at 8 o'clock. Feel free to raise your hand with questions at any time. At this time, I'd like to invite the uh, dean of our library, Ms. Dr. Ellen Safely, up here to uh, introduce Mr. Ede. Thank you, Jim. So tonight we're welcoming the Chess Educator of the Year for 2016, James Ede. We are in the presence of chess greatness tonight. <clears throat> he is an American chess master and holds the title of FIDE. I was told that was FIDE, master, other words, FIDE of the World Chess Federation, that FIDE is French. Oui. Um, he's written many books, including um, especially for me, Chess for Dummies. It's in its third edition. I was told it is, you're working on the fourth edition. That keeps me spending money. And um, he also wrote a book on um, chess openings. Both of them are on the top of the Amazon list for books on chess. So, yay. Um, I asked him today about chess openings, and I'm still in the dummy book, I guess. <laughs> He also publishes chess books, and um, there was a flyer for this presentation about um, all the accolades and accomplishments that he's made, so I'm going to skip those but say that they're numerous and fantastic. Um, I was told he was um, doing, a book on, I mean, doing a presentation on making of a chess reference book, but it's about the dummies book. So please join me in congratulating um, James and welcoming him to UT Dallas. So. Thank you, Dr. Chafe. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying what a tremendous honor this is. It was completely unexpected, and I was just tickled pink when I got the call from, from Jim Stallings. Um, and I have had a long association with UT Dallas, and I especially think that this award is going to be one of the highlights of my chess career. So I'm just going to, I think, back up a little bit. We're going to, I originally was going to talk about doing a chess reference, and I'm going to come back to this. As a matter of fact, I'm going to iterate through my chess life multiple times. Um, because a chess reference is different than a how-to instruction book, and we'll, we'll talk more about it later. But the th thing that I really wanted to concentrate on after you know a cu couple of back and forth conversations with Jim Stallings was, you know, the whole idea of the Chess for Dummies book was unlikely. It, it came out of nowhere, and all sorts of things. And it's so true in life and different things, all sorts of things had to click into place before it happened. But I want to go back to how I started, and it was in 1972, uh, and it was, and this is not going to surprise anyone, it was because of Bobby Fischer. He was on the cover of magazines, he was on the front page of the New York Times, uh, all of a sudden chess became popular, and at the same time I had, as I s suffered a knee injury skiing, and so I was, I really couldn't move around very much. And so my dad bought a copy of uh, Aaron Nimzovich's My System. And I sort of taught myself the game. And he would go to the just used bookstore and buy 25 cent editions of whatever. And I just kept, and the more I played and the more I studied, and the more I enjoyed it. And Nimzovich was a treat because he didn't talk like the other chess writers. He was like, you know, oh, the past pawn needs to be imprisoned. You know, it was, it was a very entertaining, in my way of thinking anyways. And so I uh, played my first USCF tournament game 
that year, uh, and I, I was 15, which is ancient by today's standards. You know, you, 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 everybody's, they're chess masters at the age of 10 now. Uh, yet, when I would go to a tournament, I would be the youngest person there. Because before Bobby Fischer, chess was a very uh, barren environment in the United States. There, there really wasn't a whole lot going on. And people used to travel, we were talking about this at lunch, used to travel distances just to play somebody at the, you know, your caliber because you didn't have that opportunity. There weren't that many good players around. So um, it was, it was an, a very different experience after Fisher. All of a sudden there was a big influx of people. And there's a whole bunch of guys I mentioned, uh, Nick DeFermi and Larry Christensen, a whole bunch of grandmasters that are like a year younger than I am. And they all got started because of Fisher. And, you know, the, the impact that he had on the game was just incredible. So I, I have to start by tipping my hat to, to Bobby. He, you know, whatever, whatever happened to him late in life, he, he made a tremendous difference in the United States chess world. <clears throat> so I made uh, national master. Oops. I want, before I get back, I wanted to say something because UT Dallas brings this up for me. One of the things that I, I liked, I'm going to just back up quickly. Um, team competitions. I loved playing in team competitions. You know, when I first started playing, uh, you know, I wasn't that good, but I, got, I improved rapidly. And I can re still remember going to the Western Mass Connecticut Valley Championship for, you know, high school. And our team, had if it had qualified, would never finish above last. In my sophomore year, we finished third. My junior year, we won it. My senior year, we uh, tied for first, lost on tie breaks. But, you know, it was great. And then I, in 1975, I played for the team for UMass. We went to the Pan Pacific, Pan American, sorry, in, um, in uh, Ohio State in 1975. And uh, then I started to, you know, have to concentrate on college, and I couldn't play in over-the-board tournaments. So I started representing the United States in correspondence team tournaments. So, you know, representing the United States against other countries was a real highlight. It was a thrill for me. I loved it. So team competitions have always had a special place in my heart. And UT Dallas and what you people have done uh, it, it, in terms of college chess is just amazing. Um, which reminds me, I was going to start by thanking not just uh, Dr. Shafley, but... Um, the deans and the provosts here, all the people that have been so supportive for what was then a fledgling idea, uh, there, it was just a tremendous thing to get involved with. Uh, UT Dallas is just trailblazing. Well, I wanted to thank my friend um, uh, <coughs> Professor Redman for uh, getting me associated early on with, with UT Dallas. Uh, you know, people like Dr. Alexi Root um, who have spent a lot of time not only teaching chess, but teaching others how to teach chess. There's a special connection in my mind with chess and, and UT Dallas. And lastly, I, I need to thank uh, uh, Jim Stallings to, for giving me that call. Oops. So, National Master in 1981. Um, this was a big deal. I really, you know, in those days, there just weren't a lot of master sightings. So I really uh, thought, this is cool. And then uh, I, did Al, did you sign this? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, but um, I got to be a correspondence chess master in 1984. So uh, it, it's another one of those things where I would compete in Golden Knights tournaments, and you know, just uh, it was a lot of time where I was able to keep my hand in chess, even though I might have been moving around and and not uh, able to play in over the board tournaments quite as much as I want to. In those days, we called getting it the bug. You had to go play at some point, but 
you know, correspondence chess still played a very important role. Uh, I ended up making Life Master, and, and an upgrade to that was the original Life Master, so that if you had, th I think it's 300 rated games uh, above 2200, you couldn't lose the title. You were always a master. So, you know, no matter how pathetic my play gets, <laughs> I can't go below 2200. That's a source of solace for me. Uh, I made Fide Master, and I think it was 1991. It probably says that, and I can't read it. But um, that was a result of doing a lot of tournaments, and I'm going to uh, get to this in terms of organizing uh, events, how we, we got this started. Because when I lived in the Bay Area at the time, and there were very few Fide rated players. One was Walter Brown, the grandmaster who recently passed away. Uh, um, but he didn't, you know, bother with events like uh, small events like Fide Futurities and that that sort of thing. And most of the ones that were Fide rated were inactive. So this was another one of the highlights of my career, making Fide Master. 1994, I was the ICCF Correspondence Master. Again, going back to international team competitions. This was uh, one of the things that I enjoyed the most was being able to compete internationally and represent the United States. And this was also a very proud moment for me. And I wrote this book, uh, Remember the McCutcheon. Probably very few people know about it, let alone own it. Um, but it, I published it, and it was the first time I saw something. I worked in, the compu in computers. And, you know, computers were a lot of hard work, and we worked a lot, but I didn't have something to hold in my hand that I could show someone. This is what I did, you know, and now I did. That was, that was important to me, and it started me along the path of chess publishing. And I got started in chess teaching me. The town school was about a block and a half from where we lived in, in Pacific Heights in San Francisco. Uh, and we ended up taking the team down to the National Elementary in Tucson. Uh, and I had, a, I had a special session for the guys who were, showed the most interest in chess. And turns out they just kind of wanted to play bug house. And I thought, well, you know, am I doing the right thing? And I realized these kids have their lives so structured and so programmed. Bug house lets them blow off steam. You know, what's wrong with this? Ah, bug house is a, a two-person team where you, if you ca if you capture a, a, a piece from your opponent, you give it to your uh, partner, and they can use it in any way they they see fit. And so they went to the national elementary, and they nobody meddled, but uh, our bug house team went six zero. <laughs> 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 But the, one of the, the things I'll never forget is teaching at the Malcolm X Academy in Bayview Hunters Point, which was uh, a very uh, hard, hard luck kind of community. Um, and I can remember going there to teach. I taught on Wednesdays there. And kids would stop and stare at me. Because, you know, I was white. I was like, what are you doing? Oh, something bad's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but with the other, other schools that I taught at, these kids were being prepared for colleges and, and in, in Malcolm X Academy, they, they knew, and this is one of the gifts that our society has given to, to people, it, they think, these kids think if they can play chess, they must be smart. You know, I didn't tell them that, but our society has, and, they all learned that they could play chess. And I think that self-esteem improvement was directly transferable back into the classroom. Because they really started to think, I must be smart. I can play chess. Uh, and I started teaching at the Mechanics Institute. There were a couple of different things. There was an open um, uh, class that I held every week and then there was another one for seniors and I'm going to get back to seniors in a, in a second but it was, 
it was one of those things that I uh, enjoyed doing a great deal. I taught at the VA hospitals in the area, and it's just so I wanted to point this out because it was a very valuable lesson to me. There's one that was for uh, um, vets with physical handicaps and others with uh, mental handicaps and issues. And uh, my chess program did not take off at the, the physical one at all. I think the most people I ever had turn out was four. But the one that uh, I did it, it, the one for to help with people with mental challenges, that was 20 people if, you know, on a bad day. You know, they, and they just got a lot out of it. They looked forward to it. They were enthusiastic. And there was something about, hey, my, my brain's still working. You know, everything is okay or something. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. At the same time, I was teaching at the Boys and Girls Club in, um, in East Menlo Park. And I, wanted, I made this note about internal champions because the same thing happened at both the, the, um, the VA hospital and the Boys and Girls Club. And the, the person that was internal uh, that arranged the everything, did the, the, the Jim Stallings role, um, they got reassigned. And the, then we went, went poof, almost overnight. Yeah, I would show up to teach at the normal time and there wouldn't be anybody because nobody knew that it was on the schedule. And so I would, you know, first few times this happened, I would go talk to somebody and, and they would say, oh yeah, we'll take care of it, we'll take care of it. And nobody ever took care of it. So they ended up uh, going bust. And I can remember going to the Boys and Girls Club, same thing happened. I lost the person who had organized it initially. And the, the person that took over would see me walk in the building and he would go, and I could see his eyes getting, oh. Uh, and then he would stand in the middle of the hall and he would yell, Jess! And it was like, whoops, excuse me. Now I don't know who I am. But, um, you know, the, having someone in these organizations champion chess for the instructors, it's, it, you just cherish them. It's really important. And I started teaching in a retirement center, and this was also the same kind of message. was like, you know, you go there, and they, they were enthusiastic. They asked questions. They were, you know... It, and it was about thinking, ah, oh, if I could still play chess, I still got it. You know, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it was really, really nice. Um, and so th I'm going to come back to wanting to do more about senior chess. That's one of the missions and one of my roles um, going forward. In chess organizations, I got started at the Cal Chess, the state organization in Northern California, as a vice president pretty much as a, a favor to a friend. And, and, and uh, then I ended up becoming president. I ended up becoming president of the Chess Journalists of America. I was elected to the USCF executive board uh, team. Um, and Tim asked me to be the chair of the Chess Advisory Program for U UT Dallas when it was still starting out. And I can remember meeting with the, the provost and the president. And, and it was, you know, I didn't have to do any selling. I wasn't there to sell. You know, it was, they already had bought in, and they they were just really supportive. Um, and the FIDE zone president was in a appointed position. Uh, a good friend, Arnold Denker, passed away, and there was an opening, and they asked me to fill it, and I did. Uh, in 2000 to 2002. But it really wasn't for me. It wasn't one of the kinds of things that I thought, well, you know, I'm glad I did it, but, you know, this is, I wasn't making a big difference in, in, that, in that role. Uh, the same year, 2000, I got appointed to uh, USCS Chess Trust, first as a trustee, 2005 as their uh, treasurer, 2010 as the president, and I still uh, am the president uh, today. And one of the things that I want to do, and because we do a good job about supporting scholastic chess, chess, uh, uh, you know, uh, team competitions overseas, you know, helping to fray expenses, do a lot of different kinds of stuff. But I want to maybe eventually uh, start 
getting chess in senior centers across the country. That's one of my goals. And it's hard because it's a different, a completely different cell. You go out there and, they, and the kids, people get, and they, they are willing to donate money. The seniors, they think, oh, they, you know, they're, they've got their own resources. It's not important. I think it's important. And I, I hope it's something that we, we can do. But the fundraising is always <laughs> the bottom line. That's, that's tough. The chess organizing, I started with the FIDE Futurities very selfishly because I wanted a FIDE rating. And, um, but we got everybody in the Bay Area uh, that was you know, master level uh, FIDE ratings. So we just held a series of round robin tournaments uh, and ended up kind of giving the shot in the arm to the, the Bay Area chess community. It was really a, a good thing. And the USCF had this thing called regional vice presidency. Um, and I was appointed to that. And I was like, it's Northern California, Southern California, Nevada, Arizona, and Hawaii. And I called up the, the guy who was uh, the previous one. And I said, well, you know, what are you supposed to do? What did, was the job involved? And he said, oh, it's ceremonial. And I was like, <laughs> you know, that's not me. You know, so I ended up running uh, my first I Am Norm tournament, uh, but I, I didn't bring anybody over from Hawaii, uh, but I, I got uh, at somebody from the other states in, invited, and uh, we ended up generating, start generating I Am Norms. Uh, this is really cool. But I had to do something for Hawaii, and I organized this uh, uh, team tournament to get them FIDE ratings. And part of it, was easy, part of it was hard, but part of it was easy because people were like just passing through the Bay Area and and they were just, you know, what are you doing? Well, I'm just traveling around. You, you want to go to Hawaii? Yeah, okay, let's, you know, do you want to play chess while you're in Hawaii? Yeah, okay, let's. so that was pretty easy. Um, <clears throat> and the I Am Norm tournaments were more difficult to arrange uh, but it, it was, again, it was a real benefit for being in the Bay Area because people would be coming to see San Francisco. And, you know, I would en end up getting a little bit plugged in and kind of figured out and they would start calling me, hey, I'm going to be in the Bay Area. Is there, you know, a tournament or is something that can go on? And I, oh, yeah. You know, and we had a couple of people that were, one was from, uh, had an English Federation affiliation, another had a French uh, affiliation and so it didn't take a lot to put this stuff together if somebody was coming from an, a different country and um, it was qualified <clears throat> excuse me and so we started generating I am norms we had a Tasha Kad who ended up becoming a grandmaster in his third and final I am norm at one of our tournaments and we got a lot of exposure for these young kids. I, you know, to young kids, they're 10. And they were playing in an I Am Norm tournament. You know, I couldn't imagine that. I was 15 when I played in my first USCF tournament. And yet, this was amazing. So uh, I decided that we were going to run this uh, event called the Pan Pacific. It was the 50th anniversary of the founding of uh, the United Nations, which was uh, actually in San Francisco at the time. Uh, and we had uh, a, a couple of different hooks that I thought we could play and, and get some fundraising. And of course we did, uh, and it wasn't nowhere near enough. <laughs> that was a big, big chore. But I ended up getting a tournament book published. Uh, so that was, that was nice. Uh, it was won by uh, Victor Korchnoi. Uh, I had people like uh, uh, Boris Golko, uh, Josh Waitzkin, Maurice Ashley, Susan, uh, Sophia Polgar, uh, and the women's, uh, then women's world champion, Zhe Jun from China, who had never been to the United States before. So it was really a marvelous experience, but it was a financial hit. And we had a guarantees com committee uh, that said, w whatever shortfall, we'll make it up. And I was one of three people. And, and I can still remember, uh, I don't think anybody here might know him, but uh, maybe uh, Neil Faulkner, who kind of a big lawyer in, in San Francisco, and he wrote his check and he 
So, well, I got my money's worth. And I was thinking, well, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. And, he, and then I uh, decided I was going to start publishing. Uh, I just got a, this thing for uh, desktop publishing at the time. I produced the California Chess N N News, the Cal Chess Journal. And I always want to give this, this shout out because it was the first dummies book that I ever owned, the Microsoft Word for Dummies, because it taught me so much. And I remember getting Microsoft Manual out and thinking, oh, man, how am I going to learn this? I'm going to need to know these macros, these page layout, and all this kind of stuff. And, and I was walking through this bookstore, which is probably not an experience the younger people have. But uh, in those days, it was one of the ways you, you kill time is, you know, you find yourself, you know, waiting for an appointment, you know, go to the bookstore and just browse. And I saw this. Microsoft Word for Dummies, and I bought it, and it was wonderful. The explanations were clear. I could find everything I wanted. Uh, so that was a, an important turning point because it implanted the dummies uh, image in my mind. I got my master's from the University of San Francisco, and they taught about this concept of virtual corporation. I thought, you know, hey, this uh, virtual corporation is the way to go in the chess world. You know, you don't want employees, but you can sign contracts. You can write contracts with the, the author. You can write contracts with the printer. You can write contracts with someone doing the, the page layout. You know, so this is really good. And then, you know, I, I just thought this is clicking. Um, I'm, I'm publishing and, and this, this whole concept in this storage space at that time, and I'm really dating myself now, but... It, I think we went from five and a quarter floppy inches to three and a half inch floppy disks. And all of a sudden the disk storage space was adequate to contain a book on chess. And I thought, oh, I have to do this. This is all coming together for a reason. I've got the content now. I've, I've got a, a bunch of books. Uh, all, I, all I need is the software to translate. All I need is the, the software to translate from the books to the discs, to, so it display properly on the on the uh, on the computer. Uh, California Chess Journal just wanted to you know, shout out. This was the Pan Pacific, and this is uh, Nick DeFermian, John Nunn, and some of the other players that that played. Uh, and uh, one of the books that I produced was one of my favorites, the Bobby Fischer I knew by Arnold Denker. Uh, and it was really quite an experience getting, again, having something to hold in your hand, saying, I did this. I got this done. But I had this great idea, and I think it was proven to be a good idea because I was beaten to market twice. <laughs> Once by Chessbase, they came out with uh, this computer software that was doing everything I had planned on doing and more. And I thought, well, you know, it's not so bad to be second in the market. And, then New and Chess came out. They did everything I was going to do and more. So then I thought, oh, well, you know, I'm going to get to uh, uh, Chess for Dummies. Um, now, why Chess for Dummies? Why did it occur to me? One is that as a publisher, I like their story. They insulted their, I'll do the bullet points. It was oversized. It didn't fit properly in the in the bookshelves, and uh, it was rather garish. Now you, that meant you knew you, when you looked across the bookstore, you knew what it was. It was a for dummies book, but uh, the pub, the uh, bookstore people, the, the the mainstream people didn't like it, and they insulted the readers in the title, and that was a no no. You didn't do that. And then they bypassed the normal channels. They went to the Costco's, the Price Clubs, the everywhere. You know, everywhere they went, they ended up having to, uh, or they had enormous sales, and the and the bookstores had to come to them. And it was like, what a publishing success! I just was so impressed. And then I noticed I was again just wandering through a bookstore, and I noticed. They had started something they called the trade press. And I, 
I think the first one, I might be getting this wrong, but I think it was wine for dummy, dummies, but it wasn't chess. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't computers. It had all been computers up until then. And I said, well, you know, chess is great. Th these guys are really good at demystifying a concept that people think is too hard for them to understand. This is their specialty. Uh, I think chess would be perfect for them. So I wrote a query letter. They, it was IDG Books at the time, and they were just across the bay in, in Fremont. Uh, and they wrote back and asked me for a sample chapter, and I supplied that. And I thought, you know, I'm not sure if this is going anywhere now. In, but it was another one of those things that just clicked into place. We're at a, a family function, and a uh, relative asked me, you know, what are you doing? And I said, well, I wrote this letter, but I, and I wrote this sample chapter, and I, I'm not sure it's, it's going anywhere. And he says, gee, I know somebody there. Oh, really? And put me to, together with, with her, uh, Lori McGovern, and uh, she set up a face-to-face -face meeting. That was the difference, you know, between a, a sample chapter, which anybody could submit, and getting in front of someone's face. That was really uh, critical. Wouldn't have happened without her. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about writing uh, Chess for Dummies. It's one. It's very intimidating to look at a blank page when you start a new project. Uh, and, you th and then I thought, well, well, how do you get started? You start usually with an outline. Well, in this case, it's just a table of contents. You know, I, got, I just made a list of things that I was going to write about. Now, we're back to the how-to versus the reference. The how-to books are, generally speaking, uh, sequential. You work through them and, they, and you learn more as you go. Uh, but a reference is more along the lines of something you look up. You have a question, you look it up. And you've got to, have to be able to find it. And you have to you know, get a, a clear explanation when you go to find it, that explanation. And they had this idea, everything was uh, in modularity. In other words, you didn't have to read chapter two after chapter one. You know, everything was standalone, separate, and the ease of use. And I can still remember the first time this happened. Maybe it wasn't the first time, but it's the one that sticks in my head. Was uh, I used the term score sheet? The editor kicked it back. What's a score sheet? And there was a lot of those kinds of experiences where I would use a chess term, and they would say, "Well, what does that mean?" And I, oh, okay, and so you, you put it into easy to understand language that doesn't apply, assume any implied knowledge. And that was a, one of the, the keys to being able to get uh, Chess for Dummies off the ground. Is that it? I think I came to the end. Yes. Um, so the whole concept of arriving at Chess for Dummies, I had to have all of these things uh, start and, and happen in my life that made me think of it in the first place. I had to have uh, the love of the, the story, and then I had to have a, a person that would got me a face-to-face -face meeting. All of these things had to click into place. And then I basically had to learn how to write a chess reference. It was one thing, I, everything I had written before was an opening book or a tournament book or, or this. And so this was uncharted territory to me. And it was a it was great learning experience. It's now in its, uh, I'm working on its fourth edition. It's been translated into I don't know how many languages, countless languages. <laughs> I've, I lost track years ago. Um, and the, the, the IDG people sold hundreds of thousands of chess for dummies. It was acquired by Hungry Minds. They sold hundreds of thousands. It was acquired by Wiley, uh, which is mostly, maybe some of you know, the, a textbook uh, producer. That was their origin. And they, their sales are through the roof. Um, and they, their distribution muscle is amazing. So I would love to take credit for all the sales, but I really can't. I mean, this, this is another thing that just clicked into place. 
getting the book into, it was the first time I walked into a, a, a chess bookstore, or a bookstore rather, in the airport and saw my chess book there, knocked my socks off. You know, I didn't think that was possible. So um, that's the story of the unlikely origin of chess for dummies, and I'd love to take your questions. Go ahead. Well, Jim, I wanted to ask you why I see your book, Hong Kong, in Prague, and a little bit ago, for some of my books. Why are you? <laughs> and the, um, the, sh the short answer is the distribution muscle. They, you know, they, and their well, ability. Such pictures from all over the world. Yes, I know. And uh, my favorite one is him holding his finger over the, my, my name. <laughs> but the interest, one of the interesting things about the translations is the first one has always been uh, into Portuguese, which I didn't predict. You know, you think you know, French, German, Spanish. But uh, it's always been Portuguese. And I think the reason is, is they have a real favorable contract. A real, you know, so they they do that kind of stuff, and then they say, "Hey, well, you know, look, uh, Country X, it's selling really w well in translation, so you might want to get behind this." And uh, and then they can afford to pay somebody to translate and do all of those types of things. And you know, not everyone's married to a German native German speaker, so <laughs> I, I think that's the reason. Go ahead. So what projects are you working on now? Uh, right now, it's, it's the, uh, the fourth edition. And the second one, I, I wrote this book called uh, uh, The Chess Player's Bible, which was distributed by Barron's, another person who, uh, company who gets the book out in all sorts of places and translated into all different languages and just, just really lucked out. And it's a London-based publishing firm, and they're shipping it right now. They're shipping the idea. So we did a uh, presentation. We mocked up the sample chapter and, and that sort of thing. And, and that's out there floating, but I'm not working on it actively because somebody has to pick it up. You know, hopefully it's Barron's or you know, somebody, but anybody will do it. I'll do. Go ahead. Uh, Jim, I haven't read the Chess for Dummies, but uh, what did you do that quote differently in terms of explaining chess that maybe hadn't been done before. Yeah. Was, was there something original or creative, or is it simply another version of ways in which people <coughs> talk about chess in the past? You know, I, I would say, thank you for the question, I, I would say that the main thing was having an editor kick back the prose to you and say, you know, I don't know what this means. And, oh, okay. Because in the chess world, well, there's a couple of things. One was, in the chess world, we used to try to cram in as much knowledge and as much information as possible. So it's kind of physically ugly. And, <laughs> and the chess for dummies was more attractive, a lot of white space. And, and that's not easy to do. That, takes, that costs money. But it was the getting it kicked back to me over and over again, rewrite this, rewrite that, and so that anybody could understand it. And I don't think too many chess writers have ever had that privilege. And it was mine. Go ahead. Did they give you any statistics on uh, chess for dummies in terms of like the average age group or the age group that buys the most? You know, I can only answer that because I don't have any statistics to back this up. But I can tell you who I had in mind when I was writing it, and it was the uh, the, the chess parent. Because my experience was, you know, my dad, I, my dad, my brother, and I would play chess after after dinner. That's how I got started, um, and I started beating him and my dad, and he didn't like to lose, so. He, he said, you know, okay, I'm, what am I going to do? Okay, I'm going to buy him these books, and uh, I'm going to get a friend of mine. He taught at the North Adams State College at the time, and a friend of mine and take him to the North Adams State Chess Club so I don't have to play him anymore. And, and I thought a lot of these parents 
know how to play chess, you know, they know a little bit about the game, but they had these kids now that are getting so good, so young. And, they, you know, at least chess for dummies can help them talk a better game, you know? And I think that was uh, the target audience was the chess parents. And I, I think I keep selling books mostly because there's these new kids coming on the block and they, the kids aren't necessarily interested in chess for dummies, but they, they all have parents who think, you know, I need, to, I need this some help here. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's a renewable resource. Anything else? Go ahead, Al. Well, uh, characteristically, you've been very humble about the achievement of Jeff and Dummies. One thing I'd like to say about it is, um, yes, it was a successful format, but you took that format and developed it into incremental sections in a way that really I had never seen. And so you found bits of information that worked in that format that makes it easy to understand. It wasn't all just a minute. Dummies machine. You know, it was your writing and your thinking when What a nice thing to say, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, you're saying that the future projects are Yes. <clears throat> yes, um, I, I belong to a, a, another 501c3 organization that uh, is doing research into Alzheimer's, and uh, one of the things that they are preliminary findings have demonstrated is that, you know, chess isn't going to prevent any of these hideous diseases related to aging, but it could prevent the onset of symptoms or delay them, not prevent them. But, um, and so this was very inspirational to me. And I thought, well, you know, one of the things that we need to do is get the word out, get seniors playing chess. And my teaching in the senior communities has, was very rewarding, very successful, I thought. And I could see it, you know, how much it meant to them to think like, oh, yeah, I still got it kind of thing. So I want – and one of the things that the Chess Trust does is uh, uh, deliver uh, sets and boards. And we do it primarily to schools. And I thought, well, you know, why not senior centers? So, but it's a question of how do you pay for it? And so I gotta, I've got to work that, on that. And that's, that's one of the goals that I have. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And we've had preliminary meetings with them. Yes. It, it, and that could, be, that could, you know, these are sometimes, sometimes these funding problems go away because of, you know, certain connections and, yeah. Go ahead, in the back. Sorry. I'd like to ask a question that might be um, impossible to answer, but that hasn't stopped us chess players from talking about impossible positions on chess boards, right? I'm, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit about what the Chess Dummies 4th edition will have that the other three editions don't have. Yeah. Uh, one of them, and I, I'll go back to uh, Dr. Uh, Alexi Root on, on this, is there will be a chapter on uh, chess and children. And she's my uh, subject matter expert in terms of that, um, because that is just something that I didn't tackle before, uh, and I think really deserves attention. And and uh, I'm not sure why it, it never occurred to me to to do, but at least breaking it out into a, a separate chapter dedicated to that, to the resources that are involved, available to the to the chess parent. Uh, that's an important contribution, uh, in my opinion. And the, the second one, the second probably the most current, uh, is just software and the internet, and that keeps adapting and changing. And everything I write is out of date almost instantly. And you know, you just you keep every time you do another edition, you look at this. Well, this site didn't exist before, and now it's like the most popular. And so you have to pay attention to that kind of stuff. And the third edition doesn't even mention Magnus Carlsen, you know, so I have to update that. And he's going to push um, a towel out of the top ten list, unfortunately. Somebody has to go. And, 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he's got a bullet next to his name, Carlson, and I don't know how far he's going to go, but he's going to go pretty far in terms of uh, top ten all time. I think he plays everybody. He plays in all the tournaments, and he wins so often. You know, that is a tremendous talent that we have the privilege of watching. So I want to write a little bit about him in, in particular. Yeah. Anything else? Go ahead, Jim. Ah, right. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, it was really interesting. I mean, the seniors pulled it out. Yeah. 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 That was uh, the the senior matches that that we've done against kids in in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. You know, when the seniors win it, they say it's old age and treachery. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, those are those are uh, important things. Go ahead. Do you, have, do you do a blog or anything in social, social media? Uh, not not really. Uh, I don't do a blog anymore. I used to. That was that was kind of been, been taken over by Facebook and and, and all the, this sort of stuff. And I used to write for our website. Uh, Al Lawrence is is now doing all of our social media kind of stuff. It's one of less thing for me. Uh, to, to do, and he does it so well, so. Anything else? Well, thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your coming. And what a great honor this has been. Presenting the award for this year will be Dr. Abby Kratz, Associate Provost at UT Dallas. This is still in plastic, so you're all going to have to appreciate what this is in plastic. But first, um, let me say, um, just in your remarks, you said you can't take credit for the sales, but you can take credit for the learning that's going on. And as Chess Educator of the Year, this is what we're about. In higher education, we're all about learning outcomes, and I think you've contributed greatly to the world of chess by helping people learn the game. How nice. How nice. So. One more thing, okay. On one of your websites, I saw that you are referred to as a chess politician. Uh, okay. And that I have, wouldn't be my site. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Your picture was on it. Yeah. But <laughs> I also noted that you've written this book, Chess Player's Bible. Yes. So I'm wondering, because I'm very influenced by what's going on politically in the state of Texas these days, are you the leader of the evangelic chess <laughs> movement? <laughs> in which case, I would probably vote for you. Congratulations. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. We really appreciate everybody coming out here tonight and look forward to seeing you in the future, maybe at uh, uh, the event next year. We have a tournament coming up on March 11th. They were talking about IM norms. At this tournament, you can make a GM norm, become a grandmaster. It'll match uh, the UTD, uh, five of our grandmasters, against five of the top players in the United States. The average age is about 16. And... Uh, 
I hate to say it, but our team's got their work cut out for them. Their opponents have a little bit higher ratings this year. So it wasn't easy last year. So so at least you'll have a chance to, to win some rating points, you know. But it's it's a the vent's called a Shevinigan. It's a double round robin. And this was invented so you could have one team play the other team. And you get to play a black and a white, so nobody can claim that they didn't have the right colors. So with five against five, two rounds, two colors each, it'd be ten rounds. We'll be playing that at the Embassy Suites during our spring break, March 11th to March 16th, ten rounds. And, and the UTD team would like for you to come out and root for them. We'll also have a live video broadcast of that. Uh, Grandmaster Akopian will be, uh, Veruzzi and Akopian will be giving commentary with our chess coach, I am uh, Roddy Milovanovich. So if you get a chance, come on out to that as well. It's the one at Park Central. It's, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, and this will conclude tonight's ceremony. Thank you.